possibilities. And uh, they ruled that technologies such as AI can play uh, in providing uh, more insight into uh, this uh, issue and also solutions that we can uh, get from uh, using these technologies to solve these uh, uh, problems. Uh, we know that you are in uh, also different time zones and it's not uh, necessarily uh, a very good time for all of you, but we appreciate that you have joined us uh, despite the, the situation and time zone where you are at. Uh, I also would like to thank our, the member of our organizing committee uh, from CFAL York and uh, Transformative Disaster Risk Governance uh, webinar series, particularly Shirin Risk and Dr. Mahnaz Alavi Najat for their efforts and organizing the event. Now, without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jude Kong, uh, Kong, who will be moderating this session. Dr. Kong is professor at York University, uh, Canada, and the funding member and director of uh, the Africa Canada Artificial Intelligence and Data Innovation Consortium. Uh, he's a member of the Canadian Black Scientist Network a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of Mathematics for Public Health Network, and a member of the Canadian COVID-19 Modeling Rapid Response Task Force. Dr. Kong is an expert in artificial intelligence, data science, and infectious disease modeling. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he has been leading an interdisciplinary team of more than 50 researchers from key academic and government institutions in nine African countries that have been leveraging artificial intelligence to predict and forecast COVID-19 infections uh, in Africa. Um, he was the recipient of York Research Leader Award in 2020. Uh, thank you again all. Uh, I hand it uh, to Jude. Jude, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, thank you, Sifal York. Um, thank you, the Transformative Disaster Risk Governance, for giving us this opportunity to organize uh, such a series, a very timely and very important series, a webinar series for us to discuss on discovering COVID-19 inequities, systematic vulnerabilities, and the role that artificial intelligence can play. And we look at future policies. So by bringing experts from the community and from academia to answer, answer questions or to provide insights around some of the major equity and systematic vulnerability challenges and issues arising from COVID-19 pandemic, and equally to discuss the role that artificial intelligence played and can play in discovering some of these equity and systematic vulnerabilities and to highlight some of the policy implications for the current situation and future pandemic and disaster events and to minimize equity so as to minimize equity and systematic vulnerabilities. This is something great, uh, something that our communities need, something that our country or the world needs. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to organize such a webinar series, the Disaster and Emergency Risk Governance um, at York University. You are the best and thanks a lot. Uh, we will hear from experts from academia, community as to how these things can be addressed. But they are just here to provoke a conversation. This is about all of us. This is about the community. So you um, standing and watching, you are not here just to watch or listen, but you are here to participate, to actively involve in the conversation where we give each and everyone time to speak. You open your mic and you voice your own concern. You discuss what is happening around your community and how you think that some of these things could be addressed using artificial intelligence or just identifying some of the problems in your communities. It will be very important that you turn up your camera and be able to speak out so that we have a conversation. It's time for us to discuss. We want everyone, we have experts here, great experts that work with communities people that spend a lot of time working from one community to another that will be discussing with us what they, the way they look at it based on their consultation with community leaders or what they have been observing. But we equally want to hear from you as to what you think. And I think that 
we'll have a very interesting conversation, my friend. So to start with, we'll start with Professor Pekins, who uh, is a very, very great mentor of mine. Professor Pekins is a professor in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University, Go York, where she teaches ecological economics, community, uh, where she teaches ecological like, economics, uh, so that was de community development, climate change science, policy, and critical interdisciplinary research design. She has also taught at Eduardo Montano University in Mapoto, Mozambique. I'm sorry, my friend from Mozambique, hope I'm not butchering the, the, the pronunciation, but I'm really bad in Portuguese, I hope I will learn. She also holds a PhD in economics from the University of Toronto and has authored many publications on feminist ecological economics, climate justice, commons, and participatory governance. Her research and community projects with civil society and university partner addresses environmental and climate injustice, economic inequities, and the transition to sustainable provision. She is a lead author for chapter five, demand, services, and social aspects of mitigation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report. She directed international research projects on community-based uh, watershed shed organizing in Brazil and Canada, 2002 to 2008, and on climate justice and equity in watershed management with partners in Mozambique, South Africa, and Kenya. 2010 to 2012. Wow, <laughs> such an international lady. Oh, okay. Professor, you're the best. Uh, her most recent international project with partners in Brazil, Chile, South Africa, Cameroon, Kenya, Mozambique, and Nigeria is building a global network of participatory researchers on climate justice, ecology, economics, and common governance. Please, let's welcome. Professor Pekins with, the, with, with a hand of applause. She is the best, almost international, the most international person I've ever seen. Thank you so much for accepting to share with us. Thank you so much, Jude. Um, I think that that it, I don't want to use up so much time in, in introductions. You know, we need to move on to the um, to the real uh, process here. Let's see, slideshow. Uh, start. How do I do? Play from start. Okay, here we go. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, and I, I'm so thrilled that there's a really international audience. So what I'm going to do is start with the situation in Ontario and try to talk about the overlapping inequities that exist here in Canada with regard to COVID. I appreciated the land acknowledgement that Shireen read, and I'd just like to underscore that Ontario is on Indigenous land. And this map that's been developed by nativeland.ca shows the overlapping territories of different peoples. You can see the Great Lakes there down at the bottom. And um, we are all, you know, living in an overlapping situation of inequities and an overlapping situation of influences and cultures on in how we deal with, with the COVID-19. Here in Canada, the First Nations are in crisis due to COVID-19 and uh, the case, case rates on reserves are 40% higher than in the general population. Many Indigenous people also live in the cities and they are therefore affected by all of the other uh, challenges that uh, marginalized urban residents face, such as housing, lack of healthcare, the fact that even public toilets have closed down uh, due to COVID. So, you know, there are, there are many kinds of inequities. And I just, I felt like, uh, and I'm sure this is true of all of us here today, those of us, those of us who see the pandemic as a, as a portal onto the failings of our current society can be overwhelmed when we're, we're trying to consider um, the inequities that, that COVID, COVID has highlighted on first, how to, how to organize this or think even think about it. So I decided to try to um, start, and maybe this is a point of comparison, and I'm interested in what everybody has to, 
has to say about this. But I think for me, the inequities can be organized into these four categories. Data inequities, that is, you know, society's failure in many cases to collect the information about the inequitability of how COVID is impacting people and how it's being addressed. And also inequities in how that data is shared and disseminated to people in different groups. You know, academic journals are behind paywalls, so people don't have a chance to, to, to even understand that data. And we'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. So the second category is direct impacts of the pandemic. Uh, frontline workers and people who don't have the privilege to work from home um, are impacted more than others. People who ride transit and because they don't have a car. People who are uh, in different health categories to begin with and um, who are more susceptible to mental health challenges have been different, differentially impacted. And also by gender, as we know, uh, there's violence against women related to the, the crisis of the pandemic. And youth who are you know, trying to launch themselves as adults or trying to launch their careers in the time of the pandemic are differentially impacted. Children who are in school and have had their schooling interrupted are, are differently impacted. Then there's the vaccine access question. And as we know, where you live locally and globally affects whether you have access to vaccines. The color of your skin, the class or, or poverty uh, that, you're, that you are um, in some cases born into is also uh, a, a differential uh, metric of, about your access to vaccine. And finally, there's uh, opportunities and, and future impacts so spreading on through time that are variable, um, people whose jobs have ended, women with interrupted careers, again, children and youth affected by education interruptions. All of these uh, uh, impacts that spread into the future are, it seems to me, another category that's important. So I would like to just highlight in my talk the ways in which uh, members of different groups have, especially in, in Canada, the black scientists and academics and the indigenous academics and uh, organizations, community-based organizations, they've all had really important roles in highlighting these inequities, doing research on them to, you know, to, to quantify their impacts and um, advocating for them to be addressed. And so I want to really start by talking about how this is a matter of agency, of alliances between academics and community-based um, organizations and individuals, and uh, about demanding that these inequities be addressed. There is, this is just a, a sampling of the things that I could find online about the community-based organize, organizing that's taking place and the advocacy. So let me just talk a little bit about um, how the incidence of COVID is inequitable. Um, in North America, Black and Hispanic and Indigenous individuals uh, and new, new Canadians, immigrants to Canada, are overrepresented in food and customer service oriented occupations and also in healthcare. They put their lives and their families' lives at risk every day by going to work. They don't have the privilege of staying home like many academics do. They're keeping the economy going by providing the services that are necessary. And as a result, the incidence for people in those categories is, is much higher. And we, these are the statistics for, for Canada, but I'm sure that they are not that different for um, other societies as well. Um, in uh, so and this translates into hospitalization and also death rates. With regard to gender, uh, femicide, that is the deaths of women, usually killed by uh, people they know, are up 53 percent in Canada between 2019 and 2021. Women's shelters, places of refuge for women who face domestic violence, 
are drowning now due to spiking numbers of more urgent and severe calls and also staff shortages, burnout, outbreaks in shelters, and also the, you know, the, the, the contextual factors such as high cost of housing, food shortages and supply chain issues, wage freezes, all of these things also affect women who are subject to violence in, the times, in this time of crisis. Um, so let's talk about vaccine inequities for a minute. Um, this is a picture that was taken in a neighborhood just near the campus of York University, a neighborhood that has been marginalized and stigmatized. It's known as Jane and Finch. And in the early days of the pandemic, it was clear that there were what became known as hot spots or, or areas of the city of Toronto that were more highly impacted by COVID than others. And usually that in, in most in all cases, I think that that co coincided with areas of, of um, poverty and uh, social exclusion. And it was it was alleged early on that, you know, what's wrong with those people? They just don't get vaccinated. But when a clinic was held and even in the snow, people stayed overnight to try to be in line to get their vaccines. So this was sort of an eye opener. It's, it's like, OK. You can't uh, double down and, and stigmatize people even further for not wanting to get vaccinated when, in fact, what you need is real empirical evidence on whether that's true. Here's one of the first maps from Toronto showing the neighborhoods. The white area at the bottom is Lake Ontario. In the northwest corner, that pointy area up towards, towards the, the left side of the map, that's where York University is, and that is the Jane Finch community, that dark area in the left. On the right, it's also a marginalized and low-income neighborhood called Scarborough. So this was from 2020. That was the first map that came out when, the, when Public Health Ontario started to publish these maps and talk about basically COVID incidents by postal code or neighborhood. By 2021, you can see that because of the vaccine uptake and because of a lot of community organizing in those neighborhoods, both the Northwest corner and the Northeast corner of the greater Toronto area had reduced their relative incidence of COVID. And so it, to me, this shows that the organizing and the access to race-based information paid off, had impacts, allowed people and communities to address the challenges that they faced. And this is on top of the fact that people in those areas are the frontline workers, are the people who can't work at home, are the people living in you know, more crowded housing conditions with maybe one or two computers that they're trying to juggle between kids going to school and other people trying to work. So despite all the extra inequities that people face, they were able to address the, the health situation. So um, I wanted to read you something that before I, well, actually, before I go, go to this, I wanted to read you um, a quote by Dr. Kwame McKenzie, who is the director of the Wellesley Institute which is a health policy think tank. Um, and he wrote uh, an article in the Toronto Star uh, in de last December, December 6th. And uh, I think it's, it's really good. So I'd like to just read that extensively if I have time, Jude, before, I go, before we go to what to do about this. Yeah, can mm -hmm. I take, I just wanna read Kwame's words. He says, Ontario has had one of the best pandemic responses in the world. Our death rate from COVID is three times lower than that of the UK and the US, and we have outperformed most of Europe. But some parts of our population have been hurt, hit worse than others, and our response has not always been equitable. Rac racialized groups in Ontario have higher rates of infection, hospitalization, ICU admission, and death from COVID than white groups. Um, despite being harder hit, many racialized populations are less likely to be vaccinated. In particular, Black people in Ontario are twice as likely to be un unvaccinated as the white population. There's some good news, however. We've seen that it is, it is possible to de decrease pandemic inequity when we try. 
Toronto used sociodemographic data it collected to identify hotspots and groups at, with, at risk. It worked with communities to co-create co public health strategies that met their needs. These included pop-up testing sites, free places to isolate, increased buses to decrease, decrease crowding, and action on eviction protect, protection and food security. Between June and December 2020, the combined efforts of community groups and community health centers, the Toronto Region of Ontario Health and the City of Toronto brought rates of COVID-19 in the Black population down from nine times that of the white population to two times. Rates in the Latin origin population decreased from 11 times to five times that, those of the white population. The strategy also worked for other racialized groups with inequities in COVID-19 impacts decreasing in South Asian, Southeast Asian and Arab, Middle Eastern and West Asian origin groups. This, was, this community based approach was also trans, transferred to the vaccine rollout and uh, groups like the Black Physicians Association of Ontario and the Black Health Alliance, some of whose logos I showed on an earlier slide, worked with public health and hospitals to set up community-based vaccination clinics. Um, so he's basically advocating for a community-based approach, working with communities to identify the, the best ways to maximize the chance of vaccination. Uh, to increase funding to community organizations, to challenge public health units, to develop networks and contacts to meet the needs of the populations that they serve. So um, as a result of all of this, let me just say that, let's see, how can I go to the next one? Um, I think we have to learn from the lessons of the pandemic. What did we learn? in general, overall. I think the pandemic has really highlighted that the free market, this, this myth of the free market, speaking as an economist, it doesn't exist. Government intervention is everywhere and governments have access to tremendous amounts of money if they want to mobilize it. They control finance, they control the money supply. And also the other thing we've learned about the, from, from COVID is that the inequities are interrelated and they ex exacerbate each other. They concatenate. So any step to address any inequity is yeah. gonna have impl implications for public health and for all of the others. It's a system. We're all in this together globally. We have to address these inequities and the pandemic is a portal. Right, uh, there were there will be more health crises, and there will be more other crises that are that have the same kind of supply chain, food, housing, uh, and health implications. So, therefore, redistributing income and wealth more fairly is really important, both within countries and globally. There are so many tools that we have to do this, and we have to fight the tendency of governments to just push this under the rug, put it off, and not pay attention to the interests of the majority. There's progressive income, ta income tax and estate tax policies. There are tax so many tax loopholes, at least in rich countries, and I'm sure in poor countries too. We have to start in enforcing the tax laws so that the rich pay, their, pay what they should. The Oxfam has circulated the idea of a pandemic profit tax so that big drug companies and, and others who are benefiting from the supply chain issues can just turn over some of those, so those windfall profits to the, to, for redistribution. The, the policies for a living wage, for global vaccine access, uh, redistribution of all kinds, and also questions of migration, by which I mean building people's right to remain, because nobody wants to migrate, but also migration for some should be an option. It should be possible to do that. Okay, and then I'm almost done. Um, the third and fourth ways I think that we can address these inequities are to uh, um, reduce the impact of poverty through infrastructure development, housing, qual social services, quality education, healthcare, childcare, senior care, and mental health care for everyone. 
maybe in some countries that sounds like a myth. In Ontario and in Canada, we have we have the benefit of public public health care that really works, and the system has been it works pretty well. It's not perfect, but and it has been totally strained by the COVID system. ICUs have been you know they've been moving people around from one hospital to another because the system is overburdened and nurses and caregivers are burning out and leaving the the. Uh, the health care system in droves. So it's far from perfect and it really needs attention and it needs to be cherished and, and built as something that is crucially important in these times. And finally, the key to all of this is to fund and work with community-based organizations and representatives of marginalized groups to identify needs, to build on strengths, to set priorities, to collect key data, share information, and build the resilience that these communities need and that we all need. The, 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 we're, society is only as strong as its weakest link, link, right? And we are all in this together. So as a climate policy um, person and someone who's worked on climate justice, I'd just like to point out that this is also, these are also the steps we need to face the climate crisis, which is also looming and uh, very present for all of us. So thank you. I think I've talked too long, Jude, but uh, I just wanted to lay some things on the table for this discussion. And I really look forward to hearing from everyone who's here, how, how this might or might not be relevant to your own situation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eli, for the great presentation, for speaking to the need for data that's highly available and for failure from our policymakers to collect data that can address some of the issues in vulnerable communities and how that data is necessary to address some of these issues. And thank you for highlighting some of the issues that our speak, uh, our uh, the community, our listeners will be speaking to this uh, morning. Uh, we'll now move to our next speaker from eBase, Cameroon, um, Dr. Okwen. If you're there, just turn on the mic, uh, video so that we see you. Um, Dr. Okwen is a, is a team lead of EBS Africa, a district medical officer at the Bali District Health Services at the Ministry of Health in Cameroon. He's also a board member of the Guidance International Network and lead editor at Emir Africa Network. He's also active in getting research evidence into policy, practice, and households in Middle Africa. His work includes conducting systematic reviews and Cochrane collaboration, conducting evidence implementation projects with the Joanna Briggs collaboration, conducting impact evaluations with development agencies, including the World Bank, WHO, and Ambassador de France au Cameroon. He has used digital health extensively at this strict level in Cameroon to improve maternal and child health using phone-based and web-based application. Wow. Great job, my friends. Thank you for what you're doing. These include use of geospatial and qualitative data to support district level decision making and integration into DHIS2, which is a platform used in public health in Cameroon. Patrick is currently developing a digital health and artificial intelligence approaches for sexual and gender based violence, maternal and child health evidence informed decision making and clinical practice guidance. Let's welcome Dr. Patrick Okwen. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, greeting to, to all the uh, uh, collaborators in the panel today or on the webinar today. Um, I think Ellie has really highlighted the, uh, exactly the, the inequities that exist. And I think uh, just as we see that this is systemic, it's also global. The only difference with my setting, which is in Cameroon, is that the gaps in the inequities are much more accented, it's much more uh, it's wider. So um, I, I, I will not go so much into the details, and I will not be doing an elaborate uh, slide as it's done, because it's covered a lot, and uh, for the interest of time as well. I'll just dwell on a case from our experience. And uh, this is coming from a study that we conducted at eBay with funding from the International Development uh, and Research Center in Canada. And it's about a woman 
in a rural community, and her job is actually to to, to make clothes, to make uh, a traditional craft called the togo. So the togo is uh, uh, is what I'm wearing now. This is one of the kind of dresses that she makes. And these rural women actually build this cultural, this rich cultural heritage for people across uh, the western region, the northwestern regions, and the plateau state in Nigeria. So cutting across an area that is known as the grass field. And Togo has become so popular that the current African nation pop is actually actually has a theme that is based on this dress or the markings that we have on this dress. Now, her worries about COVID-19 policies, and especially the policies around uh, social distancing and protecting and preventing COVID, including wearing of masks, lockdown, um, vaccination. Her problem was that they didn't consider her business. Uh, with the lockdown, she wasn't able to access markets. Uh, with the lockdown, her, her, her staff or her apprentices, they normally call them the apprentices, were not able to come to work. Uh, with the lockdown, the traditional festivals that happened around uh, end of year and beginning of year were no longer happening. So she didn't have a market anymore. Then she became worried and she felt like she didn't have so much trust in the government. And she felt that the government was manipulating data just because they wanted to get more international grants or development grants to fight COVID, which will never get to them. So apart from the COVID-19 19 illness affecting her staff, the lockdown is also affecting her economically, meaning that she can't pay for her, her kids' school fees and she cannot even pay for her, her, her hospital bills. Meanwhile, on the other hand, the government actually has a good will to protect its citizens and they are battling misinformation and capacity gaps. In all of this, there is an opportunity that's staring them in the face, and this is the mobile phone. In Africa, the technology of mobile phones is one of the technologies that has been taken up so aggressively by the people. And this mobile phone provides a platform that artificial intelligence and data innovations and digital health could really pick up. Um, actually, when you look at Africa, women in villages on low cost IV self testing intervention. She also conducted an implementation research workshop for healthcare professionals and served as an adjunct assistant professor at the National University of Singapore. Currently, as the chief scientist of IDAIR, she is co leading the research and capacity development portfolio of the collaborative. In, in particular, she is working with ID. AIR partners across the world on research topics such as pandemic preparedness and response, antimicrobial resistance, open health, and paternal and child health. Please, let's welcome Dr. Yap on the screen. Thanks a lot, Jude. Um, and I'm really glad to be here. So thank you so much again for the invitation. So maybe let's just get uh, quickly to, to my presentation here. Um, really looking at um, inequities and, and vulnerable, vulnerabilities that have actually surfaced um, during the, during the COVID-19, mainly looking at the digital space. Um, and I, I would say that it's not really due to COVID-19 that this uh, has arised, but really it's, it has been sort of bubbling, right? So COVID-19 merely kind of um, you know, brought it to, to light. So some of the equities we have been uh, seeing, uh, also hearing from our partners across the IDEA network, uh, is really looking at uh, marginalized populations. So a risk of discrimination uh, in case of data breaches. So we're looking at uh, patients living with HIV or TB. Um, there are also potential targets for police surveillance and also um, disruptions um, due to COVID uh, can lead to treatment stockouts, uh, income interrupt uh, interruptions. Um, in terms of geopolitical inequities, we know that there is um, the, a lot of the tech centers are, are based uh, out of the HICs, high income countries. So there's really an imbalance uh, in the production and access to data and technologies. Um, so much so that there is actually um, sort of 
a trend going on where uh, you know the LMICs are not really involved uh, in the production of such of the the digital technologies, but really being exploited uh, for data. In some in terms of uh, systemic uh, issues that we have identified, it's also looking at uh, lack of infrastructure, uh, lack of good quality and diverse data systems, as well as a lack of translational pathways for the development, validation, as well as deployment uh, of digital digital technologies. So what I'm going to share, uh, these are just some of the, the um, issues that we have seen now. What I'm going to share next is really uh, something that IDARE is working on and that we hope that it can actually help us to be better prepared uh, for future pandemics. So here, uh, IDARE is actually trying to um, elaborate uh, on the idea of a global science-based digitally enabled end-to-end uh, -end, uh, global pandemic preparedness and response scheme, uh, which really leverages on citizen science. And I will talk more about the citizen science uh, aspect later uh, to really improve the quality of both local and national responses uh, throughout the continent uh, of pandemic uh, phases. So under such a scheme, uh, you can imagine that a myriad of data sources and also different technologies can come together uh, within uh, a neutral digital uh, infrastructure, distributed infrastructure, to really provide this neutral evidence base uh, to, to drive more uh, responsive uh, public health decision making. Um, what we wanted to go about doing this, this differently, instead of very, in, in a very technocratic way, why we wanted to do it differently was that we wanted to go through a more collaborative, more transdisciplinary approach in setting up uh, the, the build out of the R&D agenda for this scheme. So what, what are some of the R&D areas that we can look into uh, in order to make this scheme more equitable, more inclusive? So we actually put together um, a, a, a nice group of um, uh, scientific experts and also civil society representatives. So we have about 30 odd members in what we call a scientific working group. Uh, we have uh, representation from both LMIC and HICs, uh, also multidisciplinary. So from social sciences, molecular biology, all the way uh, to epi and computer sciences. The idea is that um, instead of the usual kind of, um, you know, the, the, the higher income countries setting the agenda, let us give uh, an equal representation uh, of people coming from various disciplines, various geographies uh, at the same table uh, in, in putting forward this, this agenda. And what has actually emerged uh, from, from this, this work of the scientific working group is actually something I think which is quite relevant um, to, to what the, the two previous speakers um, have talked about, the inequities, right? So this could potentially be a how or how do, we, uh, how do we deal uh, with such inequities? So I wanna talk a little bit more on the citizen science uh, participatory approaches. We understand that, uh, you know, uh, what's driving this pandemic currently, it's, it's really uh, very deep, very, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of distrust in the systems. Uh, there's a lot of political uh, conflicts around it, but we think that this approach could potentially stand out to engage communities to raise uh, trust levels. So the idea is that, how can we bring citizens along on the journey? So educating them on the policy development process and then gather inputs from them to inform uh, policy development and response. So that in the end, we get a greater buy-in for policy develop and also increase in the participation uh, in, in interventions. And here we're looking at sort of a, a journey, right, uh, of the citizens um, that goes beyond just collecting uh, data because a lot of times when we talk about citizen science, I think there is this conception that oh, we're just trying to get data from citizens, and the idea is to go beyond that, right? Yes, we want to do data generation. Um, we also see that as more of a knowledge co-production process uh, rather than just purely for surveillance and data collection. We also want to bring them uh, on on uh, what we call uh, modeling, and I'll talk more about that. So that instead of having assumptions from epidemiologists and computer scientists, we're actually getting inputs uh, from the citizen, co uh, citizen cohorts. And we're also trying to tailor some of our visualizations so that we can really uh, improve um, the, the communication loop between the citizens, policymakers, and researchers, again, to reinforce trust and accountability. So just to have a sense of, you know, and I, and I, and I think um, 
Patrick didn't get a chance to, to talk about some of his work uh, in Cameroon, and this is something that he's, he will be familiar with. Um, this, is, this is already existing, right? Uh, participatory data collection. This is often used in social ecological systems research. So not so much yet in pandemic preparedness and response uh, type of work, but it's, it's really acknowledge, acknowledging that local people, marginalized populations actually hold very important knowledge and um, have a role in co-defining the problem because their livelihoods and their well-being are being um, you know, the most at risk of impact. So you have things like photo voice, uh, 3D PGIS, even the transite wall. These have been used um, for, for infectious diseases like HIV, uh, things like uh, community-led total sanitation. But our, our sense is that we could potentially turn this and also make use of uh, digital technologies to, to do this kind of work uh, to prepare us better for, for future pandemics. And when it comes to modeling, and this is really what I was trying to say about this participatory modeling, right, with non-scientist stakeholders. And here we're very interesting to bring uh, the non-scientist stakeholders in to um, the, the modeling work by using things like role-playing games, computer play, uh, platforms, where basically um, what, we, what, we, what we want to build is what we call an agent-based model, right, where basically we have all of these different players um, and they have very diverse behaviors, they interact with each other in the environment. And our idea is to really use um, the, the citizens to give us a really good sense of how um, they will react when a certain uh, intervention is being rolled out. Um, and finally, when it comes to um, communications and visualizations, um, here we're also looking at creating a dialogic space to really um, allow for the citizens to see the value of contributing information and being part of that preparedness system, uh, rather than, be, than being told what to do, um, but rather tailoring the response to, to their needs. Um, and also using things like uh, scenario-based scenario simulations um, so that policymakers can be guided in designing interventions that suit their community's characteristics. And at the same time, the community themselves can actually show, um, can actually use these simulations to understand how their decisions uh, will impact policy making. So just one last slide from our end, and this is something that we're very interested to kickstart this year. Um, uh, and this is really together with our scientific working group, we're very keen uh, to work on um, some preliminary uh, exploratory research projects um, looking at assessing awareness, acceptance, uh, sustainability and feasibility of these participatory approaches that I've talked about um, for the whole continuum of pandemic phases, right? Be it surveillance, uh, preparedness or, or response um, and really across over various geographies and cultural contexts, also co-designing or identifying with local communities um, what are the approaches in data generation and modeling that will be accepted uh, by them, and then eventually implementing uh, these uh, approaches uh, in selected communities in Vietnam, Kenya, Cameroon, Brazil. So yeah, so that's the end of my um, talk. And uh, yeah, happy to, to get into a, a good discussion going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Berlin, for speaking into how uh, the importance of filling this data gap through community participation. It's very, very important that we look at community participation, working with the community to fill this data gap. That's the only way we'll fill the data gap. There's just no way we'll fill this data gap unless we get the communities involved. So we are now going to listen to another distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Osgood, who is a great mate of mine, and uh, who is this here with us. Uh, Professor Osgood, will be joining us. Let me just, let's just welcome Professor Osgood on the screen. Professor Osgood is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Saskatchewan and the Director of the Computational Epidemiological and Public Health Informatics Laboratory. His research focuses on combining tools from systematic science, data science, computational science, and mathematics to inform decision-making in health and healthcare. Dr. Osgood serves as the Chief Research Advisor for the Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research and has contributed to or call it over a dozen of initiatives involving people with lived experience with dynamic modeling, machine learning, and data, big data collection efforts. 
Dr. Osgood served as the Technical Director of COVID-19 Modeling for the province of Saskatchewan from March 2020 to April 2021. Uh, through cross-leveraging combinations of dynamic modeling, artificial intelligence, slash machine learning, and diverse data science has CIFL delivered COVID-19 situation, uh, situational analysis and short-term forecast daily for Saskatchewan multiple times a week for all provinces across Canada, for the Public Health Agency of Canada, and once a week to First Nations reserves across Canada via FNIHB. In addition to dozens of published applications of agent-based compartmental modeling and in diverse health and healthcare area and guiding analysis that have shaped important policy and, investigate, and, and investment decisions at the Saskatchewan and the Ministry of Health, Dr. Osgood has contributed te techniques hy uh, hybridizing multiple simulation approaches with machine learning tools and uh, which, which leverage such, uh, with leverage such hybrid models with data from multiple high velocity data sources, innovate, innovations to improve dynamic modeling quality and efficiency, introduced novel modeling languages and worked enhanced dynamic modeling formulation using approaches from category theory. Among his many data science contributions, Dr. Osgood is the co-creator of the diverse epidemiological surveillance and data collection systems, most prominently the Google Android, iPhone, and web-based Ethica data platform applied in hundreds of health studies around the world, including for multiple COVID-19 related studies. Prior to joining the University of Saskatchewan faculty, he graduated from MIT with a PhD in computer science and served as a senior lecturer research associate at MIT and served in a variety of academic consulting and industrial positions. Let's welcome Dr. Osgood on board. You're muted. Dr. Osgood, you're muted. There we go. Oh, Sorry, I, I guess I needed permission or something. So um, uh, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. It's a real honor to be uh, with everyone today um, uh, and particularly to follow such distinguished speakers. Um, the previous speakers have really uh, uh, shared many, many thoughts that um, dovetail very closely with my own. And I, I want to uh, uh, go light on sort of uh, reinforcing those messages because I believe they've communicated them with great clarity. But I, I do wanna hit, um, particularly as a practitioner of artificial intelligence in this area, as someone who's also a system scientist um, and has been uh, heavily involved in uh, participatory linkages between AI, um, dynamic modeling, uh, simulation modeling, and, uh, and big data uh, and participatory processes. I did wanna say some words uh, about those things. So I'm gonna switch over to uh, share my screen here. Uh, and I'll try to watch the time closely because I know we're, we're operating a, a, a bit behind. I, I put uh, together here, given our, our limited time together, um, you know, a, a, a few key points and um, Many of these have been very well brought out, you know, even in, in wealthier societies committed to visions of, of greater inclusiveness, uh, such as Canada. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with distressing gaps um, over the uh, exposure levels, the, the burden of the COVID-19 um, epidemic um, on, on individuals. Um, so if we look at household income here in Canada, for example, we find that those at lowest levels of household income have suffered vastly higher uh, rates of, uh, of, of COVID-19 diagnosis uh, than uh, do those at uh, highest levels, reflected crowded housing, poor ventilation, and the need to participate in essential service delivery, um, and uh, you know, in general, uh, more adverse uh, social determinants of health, more adverse circumstances which make it harder to, um, to access uh, uh, reliable routes to social distancing, uh, access uh, good 
protection in forms of masks, um, to isolate and quarantine when, uh, when required, et cetera. Um, these are disparities we saw writ large here in our province um, when I was uh, involved in directing the day-to-day -day modeling and which we use the tools of data science and system science to try to address, uh, to try to understand uh, and address. And it's left me with great hope but also a very real understanding of the, bird, of the, uh, the barriers involved. Um, we all know that globally, um, there are profound uh, inequities in, in vaccine distribution, but uh, distribution for many other things, testing availability uh, for detecting uh, cases via mechanisms such as wastewater type approaches um, with use of antiviral availability um, and, and through delivery of care. Um, uh, and if, if the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us nothing, or has taught us one thing, it's that, um, that you know, a uh, inequity anywhere is a threat to all of us. Um, and we need to address these inequities to ensure safety in any part of the world. Um, it's also uh, made us aware of how much uh, we need to invest in other areas of the world to really help uh, enable um, uh, that sort of um, uh, those sort of uh, addressing of, uh, of, of inequities. Um, much of our work right now is focused on low co uh, long COVID, and uh, I want to highlight the fact that long COVID um, kind of took a back seat as long as that we were dealing with very large waves of um, of acute. Uh, COVID-19 infection, as one of my previous speakers referred to it in the, in the emergency phase of the pandemic. Long COVID is likely to be as big or bigger a legacy, an adverse legacy of this pandemic than the effects of those, um, those uh, you know, uh, highly disastrous waves for many countries. Um, and we're likely dealing with higher occurrence, lower diagnosis, fewer care options, and less preventive measures uh, for long COVID in the disadvantaged populations, um, whether they're elsewhere in Canada or whether they're located worldwide in countries that are underserved in general. Um, during the pandemic, uh, heavy use has been made of, of, of artificial intelligence to uh, contribute to uh, prevention and control efforts. And our lab has been one of those at a national level that daily has been reporting using combinations of machine learning, uh, so parts of artificial intelligence and in simulation modeling to, to provide day-to-day -day intelligence on the pandemic. But its ability to address inequities, while tremendous, has is, is been underutilized right now. And if, if not properly utilized, it, worse, it, it risks worsening inequities by improving the overall situation, but in a way that disproportionately advantages those at the higher level of the sociodemographic spectrum, those who, who have means. It, it risks um, um, ensuring that those who have have more and those who have less have even less. Um, Effective use in, of AI to address those burdens, I believe, really requires a, a syndemics lens, a, a, a systems and complexity sense lens to be joined with machine learning. Machine learning is all about uh, securing understanding and insights from data, but um, to really uh, make the best use of those, uh, those insights and to have them uh, speak to to really um, affecting change, we need to be able to reason about, as we say, counterfactuals, things that aren't, that haven't been observed thus far, where there is no data for them. We also need to recognize that we're dealing here, and again with, uh, with Dr. Perkins, a nod to Dr. Perkins' excellent talks, that in many cases, what we've been dealing with as, as distinct conditions, um, you know, uh, COVID-19 on the one hand and uh, substance use pro problems on the other or mental health challenges as yet a, a third uh, solitude or diabetes and chronic disease challenges. Traditionally, the health system has sought to address those in isolation. 
to deliver services, to have diagnoses, to have preventive measures. And uh, the pandemic has also pointed out how problematic this is. Um, this is something many of us in system science have been saying for years. But if you look at the burden of the pandemic, um, it falls most grievously on those who are already reeling from other types of infectious diseases, maybe uh, STIs, sexually transmitted infections, but in some cases, HIV AIDS, for example. Um, uh, it also falls most heavily on those in terms of hospitalization burden, suffering chronic disease uh, burdens. Um, it falls most heavily on those who are living in congregate housing because of mental health issues, because of domestic violence issues, uh, because of um, challenges associated with substance use. Um, all of these point to a need to move beyond dealing with each condition as a solitude and to instead recognize that they're joined at the hip. And many of them are joined at the hip because of systemic inequities and stigmatization and marginalization that goes on in our societies. Um, uh, the, uh, the disenfranchising of groups. Um, and uh, I am partial to many of, uh, to much of the, the emphasis that Dr. Perkins laid on efforts to ensure that um, there's a broader distribution of resources in society, basic income efforts, for example, to ensure that everyone has at least a basic level of ability to pursue a productive life that realizes uh, great potential. Um, I, I do believe, per the previous speakers, that to really empower uh, effective uh, use of AI requires investment in, in data sources, but also scientists and models that are trained in equity issues. We, we can't be investing in data sources that we approach only from the perspective of the overall gain, or else we will worsen those gaps between the, 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 those who have the least and those who have the most. We'll benefit everyone on average, but some of those who are on the lower side may lose out. Um, may be further disenfranchised and marginalized. And, and, and I can't emphasize enough this central role of participatory processes. Um, those on the very quantitative side of methods, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, dynamic modeling, have all too often conducted their work in a setting that's, uh, that aspires to be purely technical that just deals with the data and not with the people behind the data. And we, we need to recognize as a fundamental principle of empowerment across the equity, uh, across society as a whole, and to deal with equity issues. We need to recognize the people behind the data. We need to join artificial intelligence with, with human inclusiveness to ensure that when we're dealing with data and interpreting that data, we do so with the people who are, who, whose data is represented um, at the table uh, to inform our understanding. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't misinterpret the data. We don't uh, read into it too lightly patterns that, uh, that are uh, mirages. I think here for the next phase, and I'm trying to wind down now in light of, um, uh, to, to make sure we have time for discussion. When we're talking about conducting data here, there's many types of data sources that can empower our move towards greater inclusiveness to ensure that we're not disenfranchising certain groups who have been underserved by testing, underserved by diagnosis, underserved by treatment, um, and, uh, I, I like to point to a data source we work with a lot in our AI uh, for COVID-19, as well as for other areas, um, uh, such as uh, narcotics and, and substance abuse, which is wastewater data. Wastewater doesn't depend on a, a person's getting out in time from their job to go to a testing center, in a testing center that may be on the outskirts of town and where they can't get too easily because of transportation barriers. It picks up it picks up information on COVID-19 or nutritional disparities and substance use and pharmaceutical use and, 
and burdens of STIs from across the broad society by picking them up from sewage. And uh, by using that within our, uh, our metrics, we're less likely to, to short, give short shrift to those at the margins of society because within many societies, they're included within the, uh, the wastewater data collection uh, sphere. I would further note um, uh, syst um, systematic testing efforts like UK uses to try to make sure that everyone is included in testing. Um, online search uh, uh, data um, that can reflect those from the lowest rungs of the society to the highest in trying to seek information and certain types of cell smartphone data with appropriate privacy legislation um, guarantees uh, can also be, be useful if, uh, if, if analyzed in the appropriate privacy preserving ways. I think the biggest data collect quality problems that we're dealing with, the biggest potential for AI does involve data that's currently absent from underserved groups. Um, it's very easy for us technically to collect data from the highest rungs of society, from their smartphones, um, from their, uh, their participation in citizen science projects. And we need to ensure through participatory processes that we can reach out to those, even the lowest rungs of society. And that means overcoming many barriers as our work shows. It means um, ensuring that those who can't keep smartphones uh, readily because of uh, uh, because of, of vulnerability to theft or or because of substance use issues have other options um, to ensure that their voices are not left out. And I think the most important data for AI analysis is not yet collected. Um, and we uh, going forward really need to make a commitment to that collection. So I've had to abbreviate my comments. I had lots of other slides on on components, but I really think the most important episode uh, of, this, uh, of this event um, is, is going to be the discussion. And I wanna make sure we have adequate time for that. So I think I'll, I'll stop my comments here and we'll look forward to perhaps expanding on some of them uh, within, uh, within the question and answer session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Osgood. And thank you for speaking to the importance of committee engagement participatory research. Um, like the saying goes, nothing about us without us. And thank you exactly. so much for emphasizing that. We'll move to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Emerald Hassan, who is a globally recognized, transformational and passionate and inspirational leader in the social and economic development sector with extensive leadership experience and successful travel records in impact measurement and accountability, high impact and evidence-based social and economic programs and policies. So I will share uh, Imral bio on the chat for you to follow, but let's open, let's welcome Imral on the screen yeah. to share his experience with us. Welcome Imral. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jim. I, I was about to say, just don't read. Um, I'm just Imral Hassan and I've got some experience working in 27 countries on data. So I'm just gonna focus on a few things. Um, you know, the, the part of speaking at the end is that you don't have to say anything. I think people, <laughs> have, people, have, people have identified and said many things. I'm going to take a different, different angles of it, right? And, um, and highlight a few issues that we need to really um, take care of. Uh, first of all, I think I just want to clarify this. If you look at the COVID-19 crisis, and if you look at the recovery, response, prevention, and detection, you have seen a many application of AI globally. But most importantly, and under underscore my, my word here, most importantly in developed countries. So the first thing that we see is the huge uh, difference between countries. So that's one big inequality, inequity, or uh, or differences that that are being identified COVID-19. But I, I have an allergy when we say COVID-19 has unearthed these inequity or differences. You have millions of journal articles, research data on what often we focus on the impact of any crisis. We, we know any form of 
health crisis or natural disaster or any big crisis globally will impact at individual level between poor and rich at country level, poor country and rich country. So I, I you know, when I see that people are focusing on too much on, oh, well, well, what we're learning? Oh, we have learned a lot. I think it's a time to really ask some critical questions for solution. One of them is, and if I can just say this, so, so COVID-19 told us, oh, there's an increased gender-based violence. Is it new? No, we know it for many, many years. It has identified the increased job loss among frontliners. Is it new? Oh my God, it is not, 2008. Look at the data, look at the research in 2008. In America, in many countries, the research identified how people of color and you and frontliner have been heavily impacted because of the economic crisis, the recession, almost similar in a health crisis, we're seeing the same pattern. So we don't have to go back to the data and start learning again. We know that. Um, let's look at another one, which is very interesting. Rich become rich. Is it new? It is not new. We have seen in many crises, what happened is big companies becomes bigger. How is that? Look at the share market. The share market are booming for companies. Their supply chain in developing countries are struggling to pay for the salary and their share price is increasing here. Such an anomaly. So, so that's, that's uh, you know, we're learning all this different input. But what is interesting is we, uh, if you look at, sorry, before I go into the interesting here, let me just highlight another thing here. Let's look at data. Data is such a political. It is, for, like, you know, you can, I'm not talking about collecting data through research. I'm, call, I'm talking about all this HMIS, health, educational MIS. We're talking about all this mixed survey, common surveys, list of statistics in countries like in Nigeria, Cameroon, Bangladesh, all these countries that I've worked extensively. Data is political. Data is not collected for purpose. Data is collected for reporting. Data is collected. To, to, to basically communicate their political bias and political gains. Data is not used to inform real policies all the time. They do sometimes, but they don't all the time. Therefore, what happens is you find data does not bring the real variables which can inform the final solutions. What are these real variables? Look at this HMIS. Give me one example of HMIS globally, which has got intersectional lens in the HMIS data, which can give you an understanding if any health crisis or, or, or regular health uh, you know, environment, what happens to a different group of people and how policy should be changed based on those particular, particular you know, need of people. So that's one. And then to study, because of lack of right data variable, we see two biggest behavior from government. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, let me just read out this one because it's, it's very difficult for me some time. One is in corrigible denialists. You will see there are so many denialists in the government level in different countries. I'm sure you have observed during the COVID and still many people deny the impact of COVID and how it has impacted many different people differently. You know, this, this sentence like COVID-19 does not discriminate, it's not true, it's a myth. It discriminates based on why you are from, which country you live in, and what is your social and economic background. The second thing is you also see is mor uh, morphic. Uh, Great points that Imran is making there. I think um, just technology, it just happens but he's making a great point as to how COVID discriminates based on your background, based on your race, based on your indigeneity. Um, and we have seen that a lot. And this is not just with COVID, it's with other disasters. So thank you so much for speaking to that, Imra. Thanks a lot. Um, Imra, are you there? Thank you very much. Uh, we will now engage. Okay, Imra is back. Thank you for coming back, my friend. <laughs> thank you so much. And great points that you're raising there. I really, really like that. So, okay. Um, are you about to speak? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Good. Oh, good. 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 Sorry, sorry. <laughs> this is the problem when I have no access to um, 
Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay, that's okay. Wait. Okay, so, oh, you can't even now see. Okay, all right, don't worry, don't worry. Can you see me now? Yeah, we can see you and we can hear okay. you very right. well, iPhone 5. So um, again, before he, he, he comes back, just that how COVID have shown some of the things that we're existing and that are not new, but um, we hope now going forward that we don't just discuss them here, but we come up with solutions and try to drive policies towards that direction. And that's why we're having this conversation. So I'll open it to the general public for all of us to have our voices heard to get involved in this conversation and see how we can move our policies forward to address some of the issues. I will call on Ugo. He has the first question here. Ugo raised a very good, important point. Ugo, you wanna come on and ask your question? Thank you, Ugo. Can you unmute Ugo? Oh, thank you very much, Professor Jude, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, all, uh, all the speakers. I'm humbled to to be here amongst all of you. So, first of all, um, my name is Ugo Chukwabudu. I'm a Nigerian, but I am currently in Korea. So, uh, uh, at first, the question thrown uh, really caught me, and I would want to, you know, uh, dig deeper on the issues of uh on the issues inherent from you know government intervention and the policies and how possible it is to you know uh you know get data harness these data really dig deep from the human perspective like the local communities without really uh intervening with already existing or uh maybe future uh, government policies <clears throat> that are in place you know uh, that is basically where my own uh, uh, thoughts went to be uh, because as i know for instance here in korea the government clearly has the the you know from the top to the bottom they are in charge so how uh, the individuals come in and the research communities come in, uh, you know, has to be in alignment with the government policies. However, from what I'm, I'm just seeing, sometimes it seems the government really do not uh, have the individual's uh, interests at heart, which is almost impossible to, you know, actually appeal to everyone, every class, every demography. But then, being able to, you know, uh, as I used here, infiltrate and get those local data and local influence, you know, is a bit hard. So if possible, can we like discuss on that? If there's any uh, ideas or any uh, plans in place, I would, I would really like to hear that. Thank you very much, Ugo. Um, I will channel that question first to Professor Perkins on the government failure to protect vulnerable communities. It's a very important question. So I will channel it to Professor Perkins to have her comment on that. So thank you very much for that question. And I, I totally agree with you. And this is something that has been commented on by political theorists for a long time, inc including Rosa Luxemburg and Kropotkin. They have talked about how democratic governments tend to gravitate towards those with the ability to buy power, basically, right? And so our only weapon against that, or our main weapon against that, I would say, is um, the organiz organizing that we can do as communities. And that's why I was trying to highlight, highlight the efforts of many um, academics, the alliances between academics and, and community activists, and also the, the strong organizing that is being done in many places to advance the interests of, of um, marginalized people and of particular groups that can organize to, to, um, to call upon the empirical realities that we have been talking about today, the fact that we're all intera interacted or as, as, uh, as Nathaniel was saying, um, inequity anywhere is a threat to all of us, right? 
So uh, there was a, a comment in a newspaper here in Toronto about how uh, the United States, for example, spends $725 billion a year on national defense, and it only spends uh, $675 million on the Center for Disease Control's pan public health emergency preparedness. And this is an asymmetry that is so uh, anti-empirical, right? Especially when COVID has killed more Americans than the more Second than War, that. right? Yeah. So, yeah. so we can we can we can highlight these uh, using data. You know, we can highlight these irrationalities and ally with groups which are putting forward the uh, org and organizing at the grassroots and, and you, mobilizing voter power as best we can to, to address these challenges. I think that's all we can do. And it's quite powerful actually in specific circumstances. I would like to hear about it in Nigeria if you think that would work. Yeah, yeah um, <laughs> from my own personal experience, I don't, I, <laughs> It's almost a almost impossible to you know uh, battle with the government. You know uh, that is why I'm more interested in you know bringing that concept. You know Nigeria, yes, <clears throat> we have democracy, but then you know when 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 it comes to African politics, it's it's a different ballgame. You know, uh, so uh, but the idea seems you know possible in Western countries. So bringing it home to Africa, where the, the challenge is, you know, high, uh, uh, integrating uh, such, okay, I, I would put it African politics, you know, trying to uh, uh, go, it, it's like going against the, the government, which might have fatal uh, consequences. If, you know, if we go by this approach that you, uh, that you suggested, uh, from my own experience, I believe it might have uh, fatal uh, consequences unless there's there's like a collaboration or like a mutual understanding that they can understand in the language that they understand. You know, mm -hmm. that is what I think might uh, work in Africa, particularly in Nigeria. I would just like to make another point very, very, very briefly. Um, this is inter intergenerational and the concept of intergenerational trauma and people, uh, groups of people who are affected by, for example, droughts or floods or, you know, climate change induced or, or even socially induced, the war in, in Nigeria too. Um, these things come from deep roots that are historical. And so we don't, it, it, we may think that interventions that we're making don't have impact in the moment, but the challenges are over long, long term. You know, the organizi organizing that's needed to change these realities is a, is a long term process, which sound, makes it sound even harder, but it also opens more avenues, I think, for recognizing possible alliances and, and areas of hope. I'm interested in what every uh, others have to have to say also about this because the the colonial legacies that have interfered with our with the possibilities of democratic organizing are very heinous and we have to think about how to address those things. Thank you so much. Some comment to make. Oh, uh, Patrick. Yes, um, I think that's a very good question coming there from Nigeria um, and. Uh, from our experience at eBay in Cameroon, uh, just like uh, Pei mentioned, um, we have been doing some work. And what we've basically done is build on existing solutions, which are often coming from the government. Because the government is actually grappling with addressing certain health conditions. And uh, um, in this process of grappling, you find that there are opportunities that digital health and intelligence could play a role. So it becomes a win-win situation when you work uh, with the government or build on their existing uh, solution. And I think some of the solutions include things like VHI2, which is also used in Nigeria and across most of Middle Africa. 
they it, it being used. This is a very useful uh, uh, platform that we could start from building our artificial intelligence systems or data innovation or digital health. Uh, and coming from there, it's only supporting what is already existing that the government is already doing. So the policy makers will always welcome this. So this is uh, basically our experience from this angle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, linking, uh, linking on that or piggybacking on that, I want to just move to the link to find out how an international dimension, learning from each other, bringing different countries with different expertise and different experience can help in such an issue. Learning from each other experience, like what the IDEAIR is doing. Mm, yeah, so I think here, what I think it's 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 really important is that, um, and I think this this gives a, this gives us an opportunity, right? That um, if you build a, a really inclusive, uh, like a very inclusive community, uh, which is also transdisciplinary, plenary, um, you actually can you are able to learn from each other, and you're actually able to kind of you know, share your, your, your learnings, your case studies with each other so that you can, you know, almost like adopt the best practices um, in, in each of the, the countries um, and, and try and kind of adapt that to, to your own cultural uh, context. So I think this has been something which is, um, for us has been quite a good experience when it comes to working with the scientific working group that we have seen uh, among our members that uh, you know, people are actually having that kind of uh, learning exchange uh, with each other. So, so that, yeah, that has been the case. Thank you. Hassan has a comment on this. Hassan, get on your, your camera if you want. And thank you so much. Yeah, yes. hi, sorry. I just had a, not along similar lines, but sort of, um, just a question about, so we've been talking a lot about um, basically engaging with communities and talking about the, the needs within communities. But I think that another thing, um, you know, to keep in mind is, is obviously the ability of marginalized communities to mobilize when properly engaged can often be really, really amazing, really more than you would expect in, I guess, the general population at large. And I guess my question is, you know, how do you walk that line between having a community framed as a community in need, but also recognizing the ability of the community to solve this problem when properly engaged, right? How do you balance that lens of, of an, a need lens and a capability lens? Thank you so much. I will, I will pass it to Professor Osgood, who has worked a lot in Northern Saskatchewan with communities to share his experience with us. Yeah, thanks. I, I think this is a, indeed a key issue because, you know, uh, I think um, it's been implicit in all the speakers' talks that one of the most pernicious problems that occurs societally is um, uh, those uh, individuals who are who are um, uh, marginalized or more vulnerable um, uh, not only are suffer the highest burdens of infection but they are blamed often by others and often political actors as if it is their fault right there there's a, an attribution of fault placed on them which is is quite you know, pernicious and uh, typically under, uh, entirely undeserving, but it leads to stigmatization, um, you know, more broadly often within society uh, that, that worsens that vicious cycle. And um, uh, it is true that um, when we're working with, with communities that are more vulnerable, um, you know, they, they've, uh, um, long recognized that it's important to approach it from more than with a, a deficit-based lens, that this is a community in need um, that needs to be lifted up. Um, it, it, there's, uh, at least in, in North America, there's particularly a lot of social opprobrium that comes from that. And, you know, you see it reflected in, in adverse voices and social media where people say, oh, they're just looking for a handout or whatever. Holy, holy, undeserved, holy uh, unworthy co you know, comments, uh, holy unrealistic comments, but uh, it's a thread of blaming that perpetuates the cycle. Um, 
I, I think what, what we've done is to typically work with the communities um, in a, uh, uh, you know, in a fashion that has that ongoing direct contact with the leaders, which is focused on solutions and which works to them and, and avoids sharing out that information um, on uh, community challenges until they've been empowered to undertake uh, solutions to, to, to some of those challenges. And, and so it requires a relationship of trust foundationally between the researchers, the academic partners, Dr. Perkins was speaking about in the communities um, to ensure that um, you know, th their, their barriers, their problems, uh, their difficulties aren't spread around before um, there's that genuine opportunity to mobilize, um, whether in COVID-19, it was mask use and vaccination. And the results are absolutely, you know, remarkable that they, um, they compare favorably to other parts of the province, you know, the levels of mask use that were attained within weeks, incredible. The level of vaccination attained in some of these communities, upwards of 95% vaccination of adults, of, 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 of the adults in the, in the population, unheard of within elsewhere in the province. Um, and I think if you can highlight those success stories, and if the researchers who partner with them um, uh, can, can highlight uh, the successes alongside any future needs, I think it goes a long way to undercutting this narrative of, oh, they're just another bunch of whiners or complainers or, you know, people asking for a handout, which, again, is unfortunately a very common theme um, within, uh, within the discourse from adverse actors who are trying to benefit from it politically, to just point the finger of blame. So I think you, you, you need that relationship of trust to work with them for a while to highlight the successes and to, um, to you know, talk about further needs in the context of successes. That would be my, my perspective on it. I hope those comments are helpful. Really very helpful. And uh, one of our community leaders just put a very, very good question from Lady Smith, uh, Kate. Um, who has experienced working in different communities around the world. And so if Kate, if Kate could come on and, and comment on this, this would really be great. No, it was just because we're talking about um, community engagement and AI and government. And I know um, uh, Professor Ellie mentioned the incredible example in Ontario of how Black academics and um, you know, organizing through the um, Jane and Finch area that how that actually had an, a direct impact on reducing, you know, through community outreach and then uh, vaccinations that reduced um, cases. And so I think examples like that are really, really important to influence decision makers. And I, and I just wanted to share the examples around gender-based violence um, there's, uh, we're actually working, um, I'm, I'm actually sort of representing gender at work, but we work with an organization called Lady Smith that has partnered with um, women that are affected by um, the violence in Central America um, and are displaced. And um, they are working with um, groups of women. The initiative is called uh, Cosas de Mujeres where they have um, supported women to access its services for gender, you know, around gender-based violence, um, but also collecting data on women that are moving across borders and the experiences that they're having and governments, they're working with local governments as well, but it's the women that are at the driver's seat, but they're data scientists. So, so what you get is this, so it's just an example of how um, if you design, if you have the, we're talking about multi, stakeholder, multidisciplinary, using existing structures that exist between community and government. This is all around the world that it exists. So if these things come together with the academics, so if all these factors happen together, you can have something that is really relevant and, and create solutions. Um, but then we're talking about this, this backdrop of uh, where the economy is and who has power, right? So this is this is the challenge. So I'm just bringing that up that I do think that there are examples, and um, that that 
that's always relevant, especially with climate change or, or COVID or, or anything, right? We need to learn from what has already been done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, talking about learning from what has already been done, and uh, we know a lot of people, initiatives are around using artificial intelligence and big data to harness data in an ethical way in different communities. I would like to call on Amrol, given his work with from Plan International to H and K, where he is right now, and using some of these tools to collect data in different communities around the world to share with us his experience. Amrol. So sorry, I, I just sent you a, a very quick email just to say, you know, I couldn't finish what I was saying on the chain of thought, but I just highlight the question that you, you raised. Um, you know, I, I think uh, AI can provide a lot of solution if we first identify what variables are missing in the data that we collect globally or in a country or in the community and it, how data is used to inform policies, right? So what happened is if you look at the crisis like health, we basically quite often go into the mode of collecting data around health and the impact on health and then find a solution for health inequity. But we forget, I think some, one of the speakers talked about how it is linked with other economic variables and other variables that are very, very critical. Unless we bring those data together and disaggregate by intersectional variables, it is very difficult to make those decisions. And I'll give you a, 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 a classic examples. Um, I think that might be helpful um, for, to understand the, the context here. Um, if, you, if you look at, uh, the, 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 there's a research done by, in the UK by Patel um, and the other research in 2020. They basically looked at uh, why a certain population in the UK are being um, in, infected and also dying more. And they identified the variables, right? They identified, these are the people who are people of color. They are the frontliners. They live in a house where they live like seven people in one room or five people in one rooms in the UK, right? And, and what it did is it helped them to decide what needs to be done to, to inform the policies which will, which will drive the, even the lockdown policy that we see, right? Because I, I call it lockdown inequity. You know, lockdown may be good for somebody, lockdown is not good for everybody, right? And, and what we see is everyone is following the same rules of lockdown, which might not be uh, giving the benefit of the, all the populations uh, right way. So I, my, my point on this one is, if you don't decide on the variables, which basically inform your policies, you will end up just having a situation assessment and, and use data just to uh, see what is happening rather than finding a solution. Thank you very much for pointing out that. Um, and we all know that as we use these tools to harness data from these communities, um, we really need to look at how we harness this data. Is the community going to have ownership of their data? Who is going to use this and they involved? So um, I want to call on Professor Perkins to comment on this idea of using these tools, some of the things that we need to, as we start employing this artificial intelligence tool, what are the things that we need to pay attention on? Um, I was just going to write to Amrul in the chat. I think those are great points that he made about uh, identifying the missing data. And the way to do that is by asking people, you know, what do you think is important here? And then looking to see, is the government collecting that statistically? And if they aren't, how can we either generate a proxy or estimate it? Or, you know, because usually um, getting the data itself is a longer term process. But even in the interim, as an economist, I know they all... They always mine other things and assemble it in one way or another and come up with a proxy, right? A proxy is good in the interim because naming those missing variables is really important. I loved what you said about um, intersectional variables. And when you speak with people in a community group and say, what's related here? What's important here? Well, you'll get things like gender and race and maybe you know income level, but Questions like ability or disability or mental health um, challenges, pre-existing challenges or, or pre-existing pre health challenges of any kind, those things are often not thrown into the model. And when you put them in, it can change the importance of other variables and it also can show how those intersectional questions are really important. That's all I wanna say about that. I mean, I think, I think combined with citizen science, which as others have said, is a good way to develop those proxies in the interim or do a pilot project that shows how, how that missing data can be generated, 
Those are all good ideas. Thanks. Thank you. We have a question here from Seka who is, does not address to any panelists. I'll just throw it out for the uh, um, any one of us to uh, answer the question. Saka asks, and Saka is joining us from Morocco. He asks, from an infectious disease modeling point, view, point of view, it is very difficult to collect data and measure the attitude towards a sanitary and hygienic measurement of vaccine policy in a vulnerable population. However, a data is essential. Data is essential to establish an AI. From your experience, how how data can be collected from a vulnerable population where the majority tends to doubt the purpose of a government policy? So I will try to the general public and maybe Pelin, um, if you could comment on your experience working with different governments around the world. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good question. I think that really, I think going back to, to what Nathan Neil has said and also some of the other speakers as, as also on, from my presentation, it's really trying to, to bring the citizens or trying not to just um, use them as data generators, right? Like um, go be, really try and go beyond uh, data collection with them so that they are part of that process. So they see that they are giving data, but they're also contributing, contributing to the policy making. They are seeing how their data is being brought along, you know, the, the continuum of, of, of a process making. And then eventually what, what their data actually, how their data actually impact on the eventual uh, policy uh, that is, that's being decided. So I think, I think that's, that's, that's really important to, to establish in the first place. So not to go to the, the vulnerable communities that's like, I'm just gonna collect your data and I need your data. But really, I want to be working with you. I want to be serving you. And the first step is to start with data, you know, and, and going forward um, throughout the continent. And I think one other thing that um, uh, Nathan uh, mentioned, uh, where he talked about human inclusiveness in, in AI models. And I think here it's also really important to look into human agency, right? So the AI models are even are ultimately developed by us humans, right? So, so in a sense that how do we give that agency, that that the empowerment to the vulnerable communities? I think that's that's one thing that um, we should we should kind of um, focus on as well. Yeah. Can I make one quick point here? Yes, no. Uh, you know, I think you know. Well, it's, it's all about data burden, right? Now, listen, if you want to engage a community in a country where there are a lot of communities and you want to engage them in a meaningful way, it sounds really, really good, which I aspire for. I, I fought for for like almost 20 years, but and, and many of you have fought for for about 40 years. I think the critical aspect here is that if you want to reduce data burden, I think we also need to fix some of the data collection agents in, in the country. For example, you collect data for economic policy, you collect data for health policy, you collect data for education, you collect for this. Uh, you do scientific data collection, you do health data collection. All data collection needs to be integrated somehow. Somehow you need to bring them under one platform and what it can do, it can do a miracle. If you bring them one platform, one thing, it will reduce data burden, but it will also help you to use machine learning to do a complex, analysis that can give you a better insights of some of the, the interdependency between economic variable and social variable and health variables. I think we're missing that opportunity of bringing them under one platform, not only reducing the burden, but also do a good insight. So that's number one. Number two, it will also make it less political because when, when you are basically integrating them, you are basically also trying to figure out what will make sense for your policy making? What will make sense for your data utilization point of view rather than, oh, we just collect data because it sounds good, right? So I just want to put it out there. And I thought this is an opportunity for AI to come in and, and uh, get that solution going as well. Thank you so much, Enrol. And um, thanks a lot. That's a great point that you raised there about the opportunities that AI can come and fill. And as we move on towards these opportunities, 
and a lot of governments are now organizing stakeholder forums to see how AI can play a role in solving some of these problems in the future. What are some of the policy implications? I'll put it to all the panelists to see uh, if you could join me. What are some of the policy implications that you would recommend for some of these governments to start adopting to ensure that they're able to use AI to address some of these issues that we have all identified and discussed here today? Um, maybe I'll start with uh, Professor Osgood. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think uh, just building on a lot of what was said here, um, there's tremendous opportunities for, um, for, in my mind, for learning from what we've been through with this pandemic. We've seen the reflections here, and I can assure you that um, similar conversations have occurred not only with other academics, but uh, from my, my continued involvement to some degree within the health system and, and a lot of thinking there. And um, it's not a matter of just the health system. As, as has been noted, there's this entangling across sectors. Um, when we went to, uh, to, to help try to uh, address issues in many of these smaller communities with combinations of AI and modeling, uh, simulation modeling, what we inevitably found was um, messy uh, syndemics, uh, situations where COVID-19 is tied, tied in with, you know, previously existing, but now worsened um, uh, uh, problems involving homelessness, involving a substance abuse, involving domestic violence, um, uh, and in, in many cases involving stigmatization uh, and housing crises, you know, being, being a foremost concern for, for people's ability to, to, uh, to isolate, to, to quarantine uh, in terms of risk of, of transmission and number of people uh, to which people are exposed. Um, all of these are, are really tangled. Uh, I think um, uh, there's a, a growing awareness of just how, how gaping the cracks are and uh, that um, these need to be, uh, some of these need to be uh, addressed um, urgently. A case in point here in Canada uh, concerns the fact that while we've had, you know, a significant burden of mortality in COVID-19, um, uh, what's parallel that um, and and has contributed um, to amounts uh, a large fraction of that has also occurred over on the uh, substance abuse side. Opioid overdoses, for example, during the pandemic, uh, are are at rates unheard of prior to it because they're joined at the hip, the disruption of support groups, uh, safe injection sites, uh, pair injection, um, uh, ability people to access addictions, medicine, et cetera. Um, uh, and, and I think, um, you know, there's a real uh, openness to AI and to, to um, uh, interest in these tools which has emerged. What's lacking I think uh, for much of it is this participatory side. And I really think that we as academics and we as practitioners and community members, um, if, if there's one leverage point that we can enhance, it's really ensuring that people are at the table. No AI about us without us. Uh, you said it earlier, Jude. And, um, and I think you know that's a key area where um, there are, perhaps the biggest gaps right now. It's not technologic. Um, it's not uh, purely on the ability of the health uh, system to take action or awareness of the problems. I think a lot of it is those gaps of understanding of, of, uh, um, it, it, of, of really what's going on on the ground with the communities and the ability for the communities to mobilize around that. So it's that community academic system, uh, health system, or, or um, governmental uh, nexus that I think is, is where the biggest needs uh, are in place and training that goes on to support those processes. I don't know that I've addressed um, the richness of your question, but I'll, I'll uh, offer those comments. Thank you so much. That's a very, very, uh, you raised a very good point. Nothing about a community without a community. Nothing about us without us. Very, very good point. Um, so we are moving towards closing. I will just give the panelists one minute to comment on the future directions, policy implications, and we'll start using uh, AI. And um, Professor Osgood have highlighted the importance. There are algorithms. What is lacking is engaging communities. 
And so it's very important as we're living from here, that's one lesson we're living with. But I'll call on all the panelists that we have here to comment, to take one minute and comment on the way forward. So I will start with um, uh, Imrol. Imrol, are you there? Yeah. Yes, I, I'm there, yeah, yes. Uh, listen, way forward, I think the first thing is, you already said community engagement is very critical, but I, I also think that it's important to bring academia and government and everyone come together to really challenge ourselves on two things. Are we gonna still continue to have discussion on situation assessment and what is happening, what is the impact? Or are we gonna go for solution? If we wanna go for solution, I think we need to look at what are the data missing here? Why we're not able to, the variable missing here, why we're not able to use this data to almost do a future modeling and early warning systems and also help inform our social and economic policy, which we know are integrated with any form of crisis, right? So if we can do that well um, and, and provide a solution that can have like, you know, AI solution that can help us to get all this data together and do those analysis and, and compare between country to country, community to community, I think it will be immensely useful not to have the same struggle that we have in COVID-19. I just didn't mention one thing, but I want to mention one thing here. Look at the supply chain failure in health sector in every country, not prepared for any form of, it shows we are not prepared for any form of even endemic in a country or you know, any form of crisis in a country. Like we couldn't even provide a, a minimum viable health uh, PPE to the health you know, provider. So I think it, it opens a question about, do we have the information that requires uh, to make any form of decisions, effective decisions to, to uh, uh, deal with crisis? I'll leave, it, I'll leave it here, and thank you very much. Thank you so much for the great comments you've said. All. Let me move to Pelin. Thanks a lot, Jude. And I think what um, what's important has already been said. Um, just just one maybe last comment from my side is that um, I mean, also tr I, I think as as researchers and and as part of the the ac academic field, I think we we are kind of obliged and we have the responsibility to try and test out the or not test out but try and really go through the various levels of engagement right so not just at the the, the basic level but also really empowering the, the community with with tools with skills with platforms that they can then mobilize themselves they can do some of the research the assessment the needs and also then in the end they themselves see the demand like they demand for, for the AI to come in, they demand for the interventions to come in, right? I think that, that could be quite game-changing, I think, if we can reach that stage. Um, the, the, the first one is the, the policymakers need to do uh, AI-friendly policies. And then secondly, the policymakers need to understand their AI landscape. And uh, most of these, came from uh, work that we have done, and uh, some of it in partnership with AIDE and APHRC Kenya. And uh, this is because, for example, in Cameroon, we had a, a policy put forward by the government to actually ensure monopoly uh, for a year for uh, uh, an IT, for, for a telecommunications company, just because they wanted these to get uh, internet data network to rural communities. That's the first one. And the second one about understanding your AI landscape. Sometimes in some countries, civil society and developers are actually taking the lead on developing artificial intelligence platforms and the government should just build on this. Meanwhile, in other ones, like for example, in Rwanda, the government, are taking a lead, the government is taking a lead on this. So simply understanding this landscape will enable the government reduce its expenses or develop its policies uh this, this is of what i can add thank you thank you so much for the comment for the question mark i will move to uh professor osgood yeah um what i was going to say is i think um i i offered some comments there earlier about the key uh the key need to invest in that uh that interface uh between on the one hand the the academics the government and on the other the uh 
uh, the, the community uh, interface. And I think there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of investment that is needed by uh, by by the governments involved that will help all the population members, but but also um, help disproportionately those in the lower side of the socioeconomic spectrum um, by by ensuring um, that they are included in ways they weren't previously. Uh, I had noted wastewater data and ensuring that that's um, that can be collected in a in an efficacious way. Uh, I I further think that um, you know systemic sampling methods like explored in the UK offer a lot of a lot of hope here. Uh, I I will though finally say that you know um, there's a lot of education that's needed uh, by uh, by uh, on the technical sphere for AI practitioners and um, and others involved in cognate areas like like mathematical modelers to ensure that they're aware of the central importance of, of not only the processes to involve those from communities, but, um, but at a technical level to ensure we're using algorithms that are not loaded against, um, uh, against those uh, individuals based on underrepresentation or based on um, you know, uh, existing uh, disadvantages. To build into our analyses a recognition that equity is important um, and that we, uh, we need to avoid perpetuating it uh, through those analyses. Um, I think uh, data ownership and privacy efforts cannot be uh, overemphasized here as well to avoid this, uh, you know, this cross-linked databases, which would be so empowering for AI and modeling um, to prevent them being used for stigmatization. Um, you know, this, uh, th there is a real risk here that if one links up, um, you know, multiple lines of data, people will say, uh, you know, we'll look at that community and simply focus on deficits and focus on, on its problems. And uh, I think ownership issues, um, community empowerment, um, ensuring that the data is, is, you know, feeds back to the community there in ways that help affect change is, is really, really important. And I think privacy by design principles offer a lot of, a lot of potential there. It's an area we've invested in uh, a lot in our work. Thanks. Thank you so much. You said it all, thanks a lot. I will move to Professor Pickens to run up. Just, a few, just a few words. We, we don't need to go back to the, the before times. We do need to build back better. Rinaldo Walcott, who is a black activist in Toronto said, we need something more and we need to talk among each other about what that something more is, what the priorities are. Thanks everyone for being part of this discussion and this, and this effort globally. It's, it's a wonderful to know that you're all working on this. Thank you everyone. Before I pass it to our CIFAL colleagues to round up this, I just wanna emphasize on the message here, nothing about us without us, nothing about communities without them. Engaging the community is very important. The algorithm already exists. Thank you. I'll pass it to our CIFAR colleague to close for the day. Thank you all. Thank you, Jude. Thank you, uh, uh, all the speakers. And thank you for participants for, for this great discussion and insights. I have really nothing to add except to say uh, we fully agree with what, what you are striving for and you're uh, doing and hope to continue doing this with you. Uh, just a couple or more uh, items uh, briefly. I know time is uh, almost uh, uh, done uh, uh, for this session. One is that this was a great session and we are going to create a summary of the discussion in a form of a short paper. And of course, distributing and uh, sending to you for your comments and uh, visions uh, so that more people can, can use this uh, very interesting talk. Also want to uh, mention that uh, CIFAL New York is running uh, these kind of uh, sessions and events. If uh, you have suggestions for future uh, topics, please let us know. We can collaborate with you uh, if you want to collaborate uh, with us in terms of uh, developing, uh, offering these kind of topics. And uh, lastly, I also want to apologize for the technical issues that we had during the session earlier. And thank you, uh, Professor Osgood, for uh, de-hacking the, uh, the hacker. <laughs> <laughs>
um, we, we, we did some uh, precautions. <laughs> that too, too. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you all the best and really uh, appreciate your time. And uh, with this, we conclude this session. Uh, thank you again, all of you. Thank you, everyone. That's a lot. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.